I'm Holly Robinson-Pete, and this is The Visibility Gap, a podcast series where we discuss how your business is only as healthy as its least visible employee. I've been a leader or an employee in many kinds of businesses and organizations, from media to PR to entertainment, and I know that it's people that drive a business. But when those people have personal or health issues, it can hold a business back. Listen to this. 81% of employees aren't comfortable talking about their mental health issues with their managers and senior leaders at work, which means these things go unseen and unaddressed. But mental health is only one issue affecting employees. There's chronic pain, burnout and stress, balancing parenting and working, the list goes on. I've partnered with Cigna Healthcare to help bring this podcast series to you because it's a very important topic. The more we understand each other, the more we can start to see the unseen. In each episode, we're going to not only speak to employees experiencing working in the visibility gap, but also experts who can help us understand how companies can evolve their approach to these issues. My first guest is going to tell us exactly how it felt for her. Victoria Pelletier has been a high-performing C-suite executive for over 20 years whose tough exterior hid the struggles she was going through. Welcome to the show, Victoria. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Tell us a little bit about your story. (sighs) Where to begin? (laughs) (laughs) So, as you said, I'm a longtime corporate executive. I stepped into my first executive role at age 24 as a brand new mother. Although I don't love the phrase imposter syndrome, I very much felt that in a highly stretched role for me at a young age. Brand new mother, queer person in the workplace, so I very much felt like I was the only on many fronts. Oh, you were checking all the boxes, huh? Yes, I was. The fear and rejection that I had from my childhood was very real. I was very good at compartmentalizing, at building walls around myself as a way to protect myself. And in the workplace setting, that was no different. I wanted to perform. I wanted people to like me, but I also wanted to be successful. And I viewed success in my 20s very differently than I certainly do now. Mm -hmm. And so that was hierarchy, and that was compensation, and, um, and gaining more responsibility. And A few years into my executive journey, I realized that I had garnered a nickname as the Iron Maiden. Oh, Mm -hmm. the Iron Maiden. Initially, I've been through 18 mergers and acquisitions in my career, supporting usually the restructuring effort that comes with it. Very comfortable with the performance management. I've had to make some incredibly difficult decisions and unfortunately impact a number of people's livelihood, which is soul crushing. Yeah. People don't talk about that. No. But I didn't want to show up with emotions. I didn't want to show my vulnerability. I wasn't even sure at 24 and, in my, and then the next several years that I truly belonged there. I was the youngest executive by at least two decades. I was the only member of the LGBT community. I was married to my wife for 11 years. I'm now with a, a man, with my husband for the last 10, but proudly brought her to events at that point. Uh, and I was the only woman. And so I was also therefore not going to show that I didn't belong there. And I didn't think emotions and my lived experience belonged at the table. And so the Iron Maiden came about because I was making tough business decisions, successful for my employers and our shareholders, um, but at the expense of showing who I really was and engaging on a very deep level with my team members. Can we talk a little bit about the perception versus reality and that that duality and that constant struggle what was that like for you it was it was difficult because it's it's not innately who i am so when the iron maiden struck me so hard was i came in one monday morning talking to a colleague of mine about our weekends and i can't remember what movie i saw in the theater but i told her that i was bawling uncontrollably i didn't have enough kleenex with me and she looked at me and she's like vic I thought you'd be the type of person who'd laugh at people who cry at movies. Oh, wow. That, wow. That crushed me. That's when, I, that's when I really put the two pieces together around the Iron Maiden moniker mm-hmm. and realized that it, w- it wasn't me authentically. And so I was doing something very wrong. I think I'd built, again, a strong business, uh, 
But I think people probably followed me out of fear Mm -hmm. and not from a strong sense of followership. We know that people not quit companies, they quit leaders. And so leadership really matters. I love that. They don't quit companies, they quit leaders. Correct. Right. So these leaders have to see what's going on around them or else how does their workforce, how can you lead if you don't see what's happening? When do you feel you found a path to start getting to the other side of this experience? When I started telling my story, when I started leaning into doing things that made me uncomfortable. Mm. Uh, I believe that growth doesn't come if we're not challenging ourselves and stepping into our discomfort. And so for me, it meant modeling the thoughts, the actions, and the behaviors that I didn't think should show up at the workplace. So I'm very very A-type, all business, all the time. I would walk into a business meeting and launch right into the agenda. So uncomfortable for me was to go, oh, I'm going to spend the first five minutes, I'm going to engage with people in a different way, talk about their weekends, talk about their families and their experiences. So that was a baby step, quite honestly. It's a big step. It's so, actually it's actually a big step, and it doesn't always happen, right, in leadership positions. It doesn't. No, it doesn't. And um, so that was that was one of the ways in which I did it. Uh, but I was consistently putting myself in a position that I hadn't previously. And then the next would be spend a lot of time with our employee resource groups or business resource groups. They're called both for women um, and for LGBT communities. Mm. And a lot of that was talking about my career path and coaching and mentoring others. And I realized at some point I was doing an incredible disservice to my team by not telling them my why. Was there a reason why you didn't tell them your why? For some reason, I think I harbored a lot of like embarrassment and, you know, fear of like, am am I good enough? Mm. Do I belong here? I don't come from a fancy, you know, family pedigree and Ivy League school. I worked hard to get where I was, and I didn't want to give anyone a reason to question me or why I was there. When did you tell them your why and how was it received? I'm anxious to know. Uh, So I shifted. I've been um, probably about for the last 10 to 15 years or so now, very much the last 10, very open with my story. And it came about because for International Women's Day, I was the speaker internally in our company, speaking to women, male allies, and others who were there. And that was the first moment where I shared the story. I have this powerful moment. The last words that my biological mother, Julie, said while I remained in her care, come and get her before I kill her. I shared that for the first time on a stage. And the reaction, the... (laughs) lineup that stood behind after I shared, this is my why, and now I'll tell you more about my journey and the other lessons I've learned along the way. It was that moment, Holly, where the reaction in the room, in the auditorium, and the lineup of people who wanted to come and talk to me who said, I had not quite the same experience, but something else, or it was this, or it was that. Amazing. That connection. So from that moment on, I said, I'm not going to shy away from it. I'm going to share it as publicly as I can. And for people who need to hear a message and understand hope and resilience. Did it just happen in slow motion when it came out of you? Did you art? Did you have it on a like, piece of paper? Were you prepared to say it? Did you know ahead of time you were going to say it? Or was it just something that spontaneously happened? I... I thought I was going to, I had planned to read the room. I thought, maybe right, let I'll, me see how, let me see how let this goes. Let me see how this goes. And I said it, and the instant reaction, and there's there always people multitasking, and they were on their phones, and I saw heads pop up. So I remember taking a pause, and I said it again. And absolute silence um, in doing that. And oh. then I just moved on. And, but, and that gave me such energy yeah, to tell say, the rest of the story. Yeah. What changed in your, your personal and work life to, the, after you stepped into that authenticity? I mean, what was the, I, the immediate reaction is one thing where everyone in the room, but just when you went back to work, what was that like? I was empowered. Right. Everyone, I had received so much positive feedback for doing it. I, and I wasn't sure how it was going to be received. I just know that I'd been coaching in much smaller groups mm. and people just talking about the challenges that they had, whether it was this, this notion of imposter syndrome. I don't know if you know, but for women, there's data that shows women typically won't apply for that promotion or next job unless they believe they meet 
eight, nine, or 10 out of 10 skills that are listed or requirements. Men typically at five or six. (laughs) Uh, And so it was women afraid because Mm. of their lived experiences, maybe because of the burden that they bury at home as primary caregivers or other reasons. And so I was sharing all of my story and at had, had shared on a very small scale that that origin story and my why. And I saw it resonated with a smaller group. And so doing it in such a powerful, broad stage and platform, it opened up doors. And so now I do it consistently. Not that I lead with it, right. um, but I want people to understand why I'm here and why I'm very focused on, you know, advocating for, you know, the unseen. So are there any specific examples that you can think of about what it was like to be unseen at work? I am, um, so I mentioned I'm, you know, queer. I, I choose that phrase and that I'm, for me, it just means I'm not straight. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I proudly brought my wife um, to um, parties, uh, for corporate parties, et cetera. For those who I work closely with, I've always believed, like I was always out um, and people needed to know. However, time and time again, I played, um, a lot of games in the workplace and attempted to cover mm. uh, for fear of how I was going to be received, in particular by by clients, actually. I tended, as I said, my I wanted my coworkers to understand. And so I played the pronoun game many times, for example. So when people, oh, what does your husband do? I've always been feminine presenting, so people make assumptions. And so it was very quick to what does your husband do, particularly as I had two children, And uh, I said, oh, my other half does this. My partner does this. My Ah, better half does this. So I've mm -hmm. played games like that to see how people would respond. And I remember at one point I knew instantly it was something I needed to continue. And we had a very, very large client, uh, a significant portion of our revenue. And the lead um, client was an extremely religious man. Yikes. And I had been very much cautioned around how, how open I was going to be. No one said to me directly, but, but I knew, knew what the implication was. Oh, you sure did. And so I knew that when I flew out and was having a meeting and we were spending dinner and whining and dining and do, doing those things, I was going to have to learn to play the game. Wow. I've always believed in being authentic, however, and I don't ever want to lie. And so the fact that I knew I was going to be in a position to – have to cover out of fear of um, how this client would respond um, and what that might potentially do to our business um, was horrible. How did your wife handle it? Uh, I tried to shelter her from that. Mm -hmm. Um, She was a very, very proud out lesbian who would shout it almost from the rooftops, was in a very different type of work, and so would never needed to, you know, worry about. She was a a contractor, so in a very much a man's world. So so I chose not to tell her some of those things. I didn't want her to feel that I was embarrassed of her. Right. I was not. I was not. It had nothing to do with her right. and our family situation. It had everything to do with being worried about the position I might put our company in mm-hmm. by sharing more of myself. What advice would you give for other employees who may be experiencing something similar to what you, what you experienced? So I would encourage people to lean into the things that, that make them unique, that they might believe has them unseen, but maybe that is what's going to propel them forward. And so starting to share, and it can be in safe places with a great leader or mentor you have. I'm not saying you have to stand in your employee resource groups and share as openly. But again, I think the growth comes when you challenge yourself and step into the discomfort. So I tell employees to take that first step, to share if it's just with one person, the story of how they feel unseen, of what they've experienced. And I think they'd be surprised at the people that will embrace them and try and bring them to the forefront. Great advice. Amazing advice. Thank you again for being here. Thank you for taking the time to have this conversation. It's so important. And I know so many people feel seen right now just listening to you speak. Thank you. Let's talk about what we heard. Joining me now are two experts in this field who can shed light on this. I want to introduce you to them. I'm joined by Jennifer Brown, award-winning entrepreneur and globally recognized diversity, equity, and inclusion thought leader. 
Using the concept of inclusive leadership, Jennifer has helped leaders across a variety of industries institute her leadership strategies now adopted by some of the biggest corporations in the world. Thank you for being here, Jennifer. Thank you. And our other guest, Jay Van Babel. He is an author and professor of psychology and neuroscience at NYU. Jay's research examines how social identities and morality shape the mind, brain, and behavior. His book, The Power of Us, Harnessing Our Shared Identities to Improve Performance, Increase Cooperation, and Promote Social Harmony, has become a bestseller. With that title, it better become a bestseller. (laughs) That's awesome. So now that we've heard a specific story about someone working in the visibility gap, I wanted to ask you a question. I'll start with you, Jay. Victoria spent a lot of her time at work hiding her authentic self. Beyond making being at work just hard, how does the human mind react? Yeah, so one of the things I was thinking as I was hearing her story uh, was the burden she's under. Because she's got to deliver at work, and she was a superstar. And then she's constantly worried about like kind of keeping this all hidden. And so in psychology, we call that cognitive load where you're constantly doing two things all the time. And that actually is a really hard thing to do. And it makes it harder to accomplish anything. It makes it harder to focus on your work. So that's a burden that she had every day at work. What would you say are the risks and rewards for someone like Victoria sharing her story so openly? I mean, that has to be hard. You heard her talk about saying what her biological mother said to her when she was a little girl, and she shared that in the room. And, you know... People just gasped when they heard that. I was, I mean, that's such a courageous thing to do, but what are the risks and what are the rewards of sharing so openly like that? Well, when we are our full authentic selves, right, employers say bring your full self to work, but what they don't understand is that that is easier for some of us and harder for others depending on whether we are in that majority or in the norm of that workplace culture. And that norm has not been a very diverse norm in both visible and invisible diversity dimensions. So her story, there's so much about her that isn't apparent. And she has to choose every single day, multiple times a day, do I disclose? Do I share this? And if it triggers a bias in, in someone, it can be career limiting. And so those the cognitive load that Jay is talking about is the accumulation of all of this energy that we're putting towards co- deciding and negotiating in a way with our authenticity. And workplaces don't give us a signal, and there are not the humans in the workplace that are that share our identities that might be unseen, to normalize that, to basically say, hey, it is safe for you to bring that uh, to this workplace, and it will be supported, resourced, acknowledged, named, um, because, you know, companies don't do that well. So we, we tend to hide for safety and for survival. And it's exhausting. And companies don't realize how many talented people they lose. And even if they don't lose them literally, they're losing their soul and their trust and their hearts and their most brilliant contributions. Should trauma be something that should be considered when we're thinking about diversity and inclusion? Because in my mind, I've never even thought that considering someone's childhood trauma or life trauma should be included in that. What do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, it depends in part on if people are comfortable bringing it up. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of us has traumas that we haven't processed yet that we're not ready to bring to work with us. Others have issues that they need to get out. They need the support. They want the support, and they're ready to talk about it. And maybe if they bring it up, and if the environment is right, they have the right leadership and the right supports at work that can help them through it and help them perform better and help them be happier and help them be more successful and fulfilled at work. And so I think that that should be something, obviously, that's it's a delicate issue, and so it should be something that should be um, not expected of employees to bring forth to work. Uh, but if it's something that's affecting their day daily life. It's something that it sh- ideally would be a safe place for them to talk about, um, especially because, you know, we're at work, most of us, eight hours a day. Yeah. Half of our waking life is at work. A lot of us have best friends at work. And, and the research shows that if you have a, a good friend at work, it's the equivalent for your happiness as if you're making, you know, nearly twice as much money because it matters so much to us, the social connections and support that we have. And so it's natural for it to be a place where it, you might want to confide in people and get the support that you would get from friends in any other walk of life. My mom used to always say, don't share your business with everybody, mm. right? But sometimes it's important because that gives people insight, especially your coworkers and your bosses, to what you might be going through. 
Jay, can you tell us a little bit about how our brains fill in the gaps from the world around us? And can that impact the workplace? Yeah, a lot. So our brains are pattern completion machines. We're cr- constantly trying to make sense of everything around us. And so um, if we, we bring to bear our past experiences and our identities and our relationships to help us make sense of new relationships. It's like if you have a bad bad relationship history in the past, you might not trust someone who you're just dating for the first time. You bring that same thing to work. You know, if you had a bad boss in the past, you might automatically distrust your new boss, even if they're a good person. You don't trust them to be honest with you. You don't believe them. And so it immediately erodes the quality of the relationship. And work is fundamentally about relationships. Yeah, I was just blown away by Victoria's story and the journey she went on to just unveil her trauma. Uh, What are the health benefits for people stepping into their authentic selves? Because she says she felt freer, Mm -hmm. she felt more comfortable at work. What else? Yeah, so first of all, you know, we talked about cognitive load. So she's going to be able to think more freely. She's not going to be as burdened. And so, you know, she's going to be more on the ball. You're going to get more out of her, even though she's already a a superstar, clearly. Um, The other things you get are well-being. So you get feelings of, you know, your psychological distress goes down. Mm. You don't have the anxiety of somebody finding out your identity and discriminating against you if you feel accepted in that environment. Um, And so that's a whole other stress level. Um, The way that's measured in research studies in neuroscience is what they call allostatic load. And that's Mm. like people who have high blood pressure. Um, and because their heart is, they're under stress, their, their, their blood vessels are constricted. They're in like a fight or flight mode all the time. And so our bodies and our brain have developed this capacity to help us survive, right? Our, in, you know, in o- old times, in evolutionary ancient times, if a bear came or some kind of predator, we had to like pump blood to get ready to get out of there. And we still have this. If you're like threatened by somebody on the street, you'll feel that stress response. And that's adaptive in very short episodes, So it's really good to be able to do that in a stressful environment to get out of there. Mm. Um, But it's not healthy for people to have that nonstop. So if you're going to work five days a week, eight hours a day, and you feel that high level of stress, it starts to erode the function of your physiology. And it actually leads to all kinds of problems. And it leads to things like it affects your sleep. So you no longer get good deep sleep, which is really important for your health. Mm. You you, you end up at the, the doctor for heart problems or vascular problems. And, and, you know, they might think, well, maybe you can fix your diet or things like this, and that can help. But if you're not getting rid of the stressor that you're facing every day, all day long, it's going to be much worse. What are some actions that a company can take to address these issues be, before they become unmanageable? Right. Well, we focus on helping companies build uh, affinity groups. So these go by a lot of different names. But part of the way to heal from some trauma is to find your community of identity and to feel seen in that community, sometimes for the first time. And I think that's where the healing begins because there is, there's workplace trauma, there's professional trauma and personal, but professional as we're talking about it, it's not having been seen historically. So every employee carries a lot of that forward into every new role. Um, and then you've kind of got to do the hygiene of, of healing and, and getting aligned and getting confident again and, you know, trusting people again when perhaps that trust was broken in the past and you weren't fully seen. And this can be racial trauma. This can be sexual orientation-related trauma. Um, Any of that, we carry it. And so every employer has an opportunity to address that and change that dynamic. Yeah, I I would say that one of the first things that that leaders can do is to role model it. Um, And so an uh, aspect of identity leadership, which is the leadership I think is one of the things that's most successful in groups, is that leaders have to be one of us. They have to embody the principles that they think matter. And if they do that, then people see it and they follow it. They know that it's not just empty words. And so I think that's the first thing that must happen is that people at the top must decide this is important enough that I'm going to signal that, it, that I'm going to do it, that it's not just yeah. like empty words. I agree. I mean, participating, not expecting others to do something that you would not do yourself. But generationally, this is really difficult for a lot of leaders who identify as predominantly white men in leadership. Um, this is not uh, was not considered appropriate and is not, not comfortable at all, extremely awkward. And so what you're talking about is challenging but necessary and so transformative for the leader to develop this skill because this competency is essentially how leadership is changing. You know, what Victoria described was the 
moving towards becoming a vulnerable, real, authentic leader, good for her. She got there. We want people to get there sooner. And we want them to feel that it won't be career limiting to begin to do that. In fact, to bring it from day one, instead of coming into a company and going undercover, because all of a sudden you're hearing microaggressions, you're not seeing anyone that looks like you, you're calibrating this and you're saying, hmm, I I just don't know if I'm going to be here long. Culture change is made up of individual actions and decisions by individual people in those cultures. And together, that shifts the entire thing forward. And also change is hard. It's hard in any scenario. uh, And to get people to understand that change is needed is is really key. I'm learning so much. (laughs) My my cognitive load is getting heavier. Because I'm getting, I'm like (laughs) writing down all these. This is so, so fabulous. I am so thankful that both of you were able to come and, and do this. This is so helpful. I wanted to get some insight, professional insight as to what Victoria was going through, you know, and what she was experiencing. It's just so, I'm so happy that you both are able to come. Thanks. So thank you so much for being here. This series is meant to help us get curious about the things in people's lives that are invisible in the workplace. How do organizations fill in the unseen gaps that impact employees, culture, and productivity? When we become more aware of the people around us, we start to better understand the challenges they face. Empathy, insight, and awareness, that's how we can see the unseen. And it's how we make our businesses healthier too. I'm Holly Robinson-Pete, and this has been The Visibility Gap.